by that in the classroom. And, you know, I began to really see that these were um, what we would call a kind of path dependency futures, that they were leading inextricably to dystopia or utopia. And these are stereotypical futures, which and, you know, to be fair, this is one of the reasons why people were playing these games was to sort of play that dystopian future that they felt was around the corner or that they'd read about in books or seen in movies or, or whatever. Um, but I began to think about, you know, was it possible to get beyond these kinds of visions of what um, Deleuze um, kind of um, in his reinvention of, of Henri Bergson uh, calls an impoverished future. In other words, you know, when we think about the future as this sort of infinite number of possibilities, the actual future is always going to be a lot less. In fact, it's just going to be one thing. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen in two hours? Well, we can come up with a whole bunch of stuff, but in the end, just that one thing happens. Um, and, you know, this is, unfortunately, that means the future is going to be much less interesting and more impoverished than the present and i mean that's that seems like a little bit of temporal sleight of hand but um uh Bruxon and then deleuze and others have really opened that up and we think about our present as this this sort of rife with virtualities of all these different things that that um could be happening that are happening um that if we think about them in in a, a, this non-linear temporal way that um, this is what we talk about with alternative futures. And I would say that in my field, anthropology, um, the same thing has happened in terms of, of, you know, the kinds of limitations and path dependencies of gaming. Uh, anthropology has been sort of stuck on that, that, that dystopian future, which unfortunately does seem to, you know, be fairly descriptive of what's going on, but still, Neoliberalism leads us down to uh, a trail of, of commodification and progressive exploitation. And um, we've been studying this, but we've also been, and I um, you know, argue this about any social science, that we study it, but that means that we also project it into the future. That becomes our vision of what's going to happen. What we study now is also truncating what we think the future is going to be. Um, so this brings me back to looking at games as possibilities for uh, alternative futures. And of course, at this moment, and, and this is why it's so great to have Jason on the panel, there's, there's so many alternative games and alternative world making out there. I mean, I, I was I was just sort of in my mind thinking Elizabeth LaPonce. I was thinking about that. Uh, uh, what, is that what is that game coming out? It, was, it, it got a lot of press on Kickstarter, like Coyote and... I can't remember the name. It's like a uh, um, coyote and crow. That's <laughs> again this idea of an alternative future, a non-Western future, uh, a non-colonial future, and what this would look like. And, and we see games doing this, um, and we also see it happening in a collaborative and participatory way. Um, and um, this is something that futurists and futurologists have really fastened on uh, so there's been a whole series of games uh and i you know in the, the prompt for this panel uh um talked about think from the future which is a 2015 game by Stuart candy and jeff watson but there are others of uh, the first five minutes of the future uh by um uh, that was a 2020 game by jane mcgonigal uh working futures of 2019 um all these games are, are kind of card-based prompt games that um, involve participation among different people where they collaborate to come up with interesting, amusing alternative futures. And, um, you know, those really piqued my interest, but I would argue that they can also lead us down those path dependencies to a stereotypical future. In other words, we get six people together uh, and the consensual future that we come up with looks a hell of a lot like Star Trek or Mad Max, depending on the mood, and uh, that's all we got. And so, I guess that's my starting point for this: is where can we go to do something different? I think uh, games, game mechanics, all that stuff is up for grabs in coming up with alternative futures. Mm. Can I jump in? I, I, I you're you're uh, really connecting with some things I've been thinking about. I think that I, I really like this. 
uh, path dependency futures that you talk about, and the, and the, uh, the impoverished future. I, the losing Atari is kind of one of those things that I, I know that I need to do and I haven't done yet, but I'm like getting through osmosis from everybody and it's fantastic. So thank you for sharing that. And it, the, that idea of many possibilities and w only one actuality is something I've been thinking about a lot since um, last year when I was teaching introduction to world building for the summer, um, I, I uh, had my students read. And so I reread The Garden of Four King Pass, the, the Jorge Luis Borges story. Uh, where uh, Dr. Yu Soon at the, uh, at the kind of climactic moment, it, says, it describes him as a, experiencing like a vision of all the, the, the all of the possible realities around him, like these busy and multiform kind of cloud that surrounds him of, of, of all the possible realities that he might be in. And then, and then he uh, kind of snaps too, and he looks up and he sees the government agent who's been tracking him. And like all of that just snaps onto the one future that he ended up in. Um, and so that, 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 I think that that's a really important observation of like the, the, of many possibilities, but only one actuality. And that um, with games, I've been thinking about the metaphor I've been using is, is um, thinking of them as vehicles for navigating the, 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 the multiverse, the sphere of possible worlds, right? Um, and I, I'm influenced a lot by Mark Wolf's portrayal of like primary world and uh, secondary worlds and fictional worlds surrounding that kind of like an electron cloud all the way out to like uh, worlds that have not been imagined yet. We haven't, we haven't, no human alive has thought of this possible future, but it exists as a possibility of, of a permutation of all the different possible outcomes. And so uh, the, the great thing about games and, and specifically about the uncertainty of games in this case, I think is that they can knock us off of those ruts that you're talking about that we get into, Sam, that like, uh, we 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 have these predispositions of the patterns that we we already know how to find when looking at the data about what the future might be, and so games as through introductions of of chance and randomness, and then also through the like when we're when we're collaborating together, those might be able to knock us off and help us like identify almost like um, explorers, you know, like find find new possible worlds that are useful to us and thinking about problems that we that we face right now. It's so interesting to me. I think there's there's also um, there's some in terms of game playing. There's some pushback on that, and I, and I think you, you mentioned Traveler Sam, which is such a such a good example of that. Like if you read the GDW a, a, a original edition of Traveler, it's it has just the the faintest touchstones, right? Like you know, there's an Imperium, but they don't specify what the Imperium is. Um, like you understand a little bit about about how starships travel and. But but the the world is not and there's the Zodani, right? But we don't know much about what that is. So there are these just these these touchstones that every group built their own mythology around and made their But over time if you go and look now, uh there's an enormous amount of canon material about what the the actual history of Traveler is and incredible detail about every star system and it's suffocating, right? It's, it's, uh, it, it, but it wouldn't exist if that's not what some people wanted or even demanded. And I think that's so interesting because uh, th that's gone from sort of infinite to, to unified, right? It, you know, and, I, I, so I think of that in the, the I'm, I'm a big like making up terms for myself guy, but I hate jargon, but like they're like push pins for me of, like of concepts. So like, I think of this as a, in cosmographic terms of like meaning like mapping out possible worlds uh, that like what you have is that like early traveler is kind of drawing a, a line around a, a region of possibility space and being like, hey, here's a way to, to get here. And then for whatever reason, yeah, that they're narrowing down so that it's not that different groups of, of, of players playing a narrow canon traveler game are actually accessing the same possible world, but it's a much narrower set. And I think I think that that's a I think I think that that's uh, self evidently a problem for using games for the kind of thing that 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 Samuel's talking about, or like the, as as thinking about futures because we need we need ones that open up, but we need to be able to the, the games should sketch out usefully specific or or general regions of space. Uh, and that that's a variable that we should be thinking about when we're designing and playing games. It's like, why do we want to go there, and what are we going to get out of out of the how wide or narrow we make that aperture? Yeah, I mean, so 
one of the things that I've been experimenting with, and, and Nick, I, I, I was sort of doing this before as well, is like trying to introduce contradiction um, and um, really just, just, just trying to sort of ruin games. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, the, the way that I've been thinking about it is um, Gregory Bateson's double bind theory, which, you know, um, you know, you, recall that, that originally he had come up with this idea that this is what caused schizophrenia and um you know it's this idea that the people are, are 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 given two extremely contradictory um reactions and then they have nowhere else to go so they're they're you know the 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 son is like told to love his mother but when he approaches her she draws back and rejects him and that that happens over the course of a lifetime and then he hypothesized that schizophrenia was the result well that that's that's not exactly true but he also sort of later on in his career uh talked about double bind as a way of uh producing creativity and this is around the time that that he had become buddhist uh was uh experimenting with zen koans and was looking at the way that that this idea of contradiction could lead to an understanding but also a rejection of dualism and you know this idea that that could you come up with a future for example where um you know we don't have to to move it through the utopia dystopia binarism uh where you know uh, uh, alternatives can be produced but they can be produced in a field uh where people have to hold them together in contradiction Yeah, I mean that, that that utopia dystopia binary is, I think, really interesting to to look at, and then and to think of like what 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 it means to synthesize those, right? Like utopia is no place, dystopia bad place, so like the good place that isn't that never exists, and the bad place that we always seem to be headed towards. And I right. think that there's kind of like some what we need is like a, it's like a a polytopian vision, right? We need we need, we need to be able to hold possible multiple possible good futures in in our in our minds. So that when we when we do that that when we get to that impoverished future where we we're actually only in one of the the possible worlds, then we like hopefully have thought about you know which which of the, then that 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 kind of tells us which of those polytopian which of those many possible worlds we're actually going to be able to aim towards. Isn't the um isn't the tendency toward dystopia or just dystopian outcomes or dystopian fiction a a, a feature of problem solving? Like if that's the negative case, presenting that allows you to think about how to mitigate it or avoid it. Yeah, it seems I mean, very na natural to me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I can, I can see that, but, well, I, I always remember that that the um, the China Mieville, the the science fiction writer, says that uh, we're living in utopia. It's just not ours. <laughs> Well, and so I think of, I, I think you're right. Oh, there's living in Utopia and, and we're all along for the ride, but we're not in, we're not in the good place. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right. The dystopias are negative, negative, uh, negative outcomes to like, okay, well, if we don't, we don't want to go there. And I think that they're most useful at like, this is, I don't know, me, me just kind of pontificating or like speculating, but I, I, I have my students play um, a mind forever voyaging when I, when I do uh, game storytelling. And, and the idea that, that Steve Moretzky writes that uh, that game right at the moment when Reagan gets elected as like a guys, here is a possible future that I see. Like everyone thinks that like there's a large chunk of my country seems to think that something really great just happened and everything's fine. And so as this kind of warning flag of like, no, 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 like this could lead some really, really bad directions. And so curtailing like a you, dystopia seems most useful uh when, when, when in the areas when you're pointing out things that people tend to think are fine, or to or you're talking to a group of people who think that it's fine, you're saying no, this this can lead lots of really negative directions, uh, and but that um, when everyone knows that the world sucks, like in the past year, that like it becomes it, it, the hard thing to do, and and the thing that I think it has early, I don't know if, I don't know if it's more useful, but it's 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 its own utility on its own is. We need to be able to imagine like better states as well, like telling someone right now, and especially in large chunks of the world, that that the world is is broken is like stating that water is wet, right? And so it's, it, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 
We uh, um, so last year, uh, Randy Lubin and I were uh, invited to make a game for UNICEF that was for teenagers, specifically uh, global uh, teenagers. To th it was called Imagining Health Futures, and it was about thinking about what health and healthcare would look like in 20, 25 years. And when we approached that as a, a topic, we we knew that we were going to, given the the um, sort of the parameters of the experience, we were going to need to prime them. And uh, so the 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 students in whatever the cohort that's playing the game are sort of get to choose what they think is the most urgent problem uh, from a from a essentially from a list of three uh, and the so the, like so like in a way they're like this is this is the dystopia that we imagine this is the thing that we think is the worst problem in this future uh and then they work on finding ways to address that but by providing the opportunity to to let them choose within a limited possibility space uh it, it seems to be pretty effective at both um getting uh, interesting and genuinely unique uh, solutions to these problems, but also sort of creating a future that uh, invoked and then addressed the problem that these particular students cared about. So, so how did you, let me ask you this, Jason, how did you, um, in your prompt or, or in other instructions, how did you get them to not sort of give you the stereotypical dystopian scenario i mean i think i mean nick i mean we're, we're we're basically in dystopia right now so i pretty much see anything that that, that we might pull up i mean is it pandemic is it is it about you know um um the the palestinian genocide what's going on exactly i mean uh, uh, it's all dystopian how do you sort of move students or uh whoever's playing your game beyond that into a more creative space we uh um we thought a lot about uh, trying to generate empathy by uh, creating direct connections between the players and their future selves uh, and creating relationships in that world, people that they cared about, things that they cared about. Uh, and uh, and I can share all these materials too if people in the audience are interested in seeing them. Uh, oh, we should also mention that if you have questions, please ask them in chat. Mickey will interrupt us and we'll we'll talk about your questions as we go. Um, we had agreed on that earlier, and then never, never said it. Now that you mention it, I do have. A oh, do we have a question? question? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna. Okay. So the probabilistic nature of games. How does uh, the probability and its possibilities factor into uh, thinking about futures through through gameplay? I think that's the gist of the question. I can answer this from a game designer approach, which is that I don't care about probability, but I do care about randomness. Exactly. Um, that's uh, uh, randomness is um, uncertainty and surprise, uh, and I think those things are useful. Uh, uh, they're useful tools in the in the arsenal of of uh, design, uh, but prob probability maybe not so much. If that if that was the question. Well, I, I think it's interesting. I like that distinction, actually. And I think that, like, there's something, there's a space between uh, sort of modernist statistics probability, like what, what Reiswitz is doing when he invents Kriegspiel of, like, how accurate is this firearm, you know, like, and, and firing at a wall a thousand times or whatever they were doing, and, like, that simulationist realism. But then also that, like, I think maybe this is what you're gesturing towards is, like, uh, randomness, but like randomness as a game designer, what you're doing is you're you're creating like contours of probability um, that you think are useful or interesting in various ways. And so um, that yeah, that that uh, well, cause the the thing that the, the the thing that immediately jumped in my head, and because I've been thinking about it with probability and worlds and, and gameplay is, uh, and I think a number of people have said this, and I don't remember who I just read in the past year that that said it, but that talking about the I Ching as the, the, the earliest analog computer. Mm -hmm. So like you're, you know, you're, it's, a, it's a set of D2s, uh, you know, it's a set of coin tosses uh, that then generates like this, this set of, of hexagrams, right? That then, that then like kind of contains 
uh, all of the interesting universe uh, to a human, uh, at least in the in the uh, in the kind of the source culture that that, that creates it, right? And and maybe on, on as much as shared psychology exists, then it's like an in, the interesting universe as as human perceived. You can look at that in like the something like the tarot as well, right? That like the, the idea of the, the connection between probability and and future worlds is goes back really really far in in human thinking right like that's the that's what we're dealing with when we when we look at divination many times is like probability and future world and and certain divination practices are like games that you build around and uh, how to interpret those the sets of revolts or results in ways that help you think about the the kind of possibility space of the future i i i like the the idea not of i I like the idea of randomness as an essential quality, but I also think that for something to be really alternative and interesting, it also needs to be surprising. And I think I think an element of surprise is something that that doesn't necessarily come out of a probabilistic universe. Maybe maybe Nick Nick's Nick's point something that was like a little more stochastic, I guess, um, might be something that we're kind of looking at there, um, like. Balesian, I guess, what would be more, <laughs> would be better, a better model, but, but the idea that that you should have something that emerges as unexpected, uh, and that this is not just surprising to you, but the the result of, of of whatever that you're doing based on that would be surprising, and we gesture to this alternative. Uh, it it seems to me that, that that's why we play with other people. Yeah, the um, the the other the imaginative inputs, the creative inputs of the other people that we're playing with, they, in in our experience of imagined worlds, and thus in our experience of, of thinking about possible worlds, uh, they it's often I describe it as serving the that if, if we're playing a some sort of role playing game and we're we're standing our our characters are in the woods, Jason, and you are the person who remembers that there's a log right behind my character that we had somehow established that in the fiction. And then I say that, oh, I'm, I'm going to back up really fast. And you're like, oh, you're gonna, are you going to trip over the log? And I'm like, oh, my God, you're right. There's a log behind me. That function, that creates a sensation that, that I get in, in primary world, which is if I forget the logs behind me, it still trips me. Um, and so you're able to serve as like a, a surprise input in the way that the, the primary world does. And that, that's why I think the collaborative experiences of, of, of imagined worlds in general, and then as we're thinking about possible futures, is, is really important. So I think you're, I, I agree with you on that. I think open-ended creative inputs from other people are often surprising and delighting. And uh, uh, even like you're talking kind of about state tracking there in that example. Oh, uh, but um, if I say, uh, you know, what does the, you know, princess look like? And then you describe the princess in a way that is unique to your vision uh, and that I agree with and then go on to endow with other properties, but like together we're creating something new that's surprising to all of us. I find that very satisfying. Yeah, the, the, it's, it sends you in a new direction that you wouldn't have otherwise been going. Yeah. Yep. So Nick, how do, how do your students do with their, with their world making course? Did you, did you just teach it? This, this, this oh, we're, we're just about to start on, on Wednesday, actually. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Um, well, I, but one of the first, the, the early things that, that comes out in the class is they often they often come to it thinking primarily, they think they're thinking about world building, but they think that they're, they're actually thinking about storytelling, but like stories that they want to tell in a world rather than uh, what is the world that, and what what are creating a world in, and you can shape which, what are the likely stories that might emerge in any given world that, you, that you're building or discovering? Uh, and I, I, I like to, I like to play with that line too, because it's thinking in, Kind of possibility world space of like you're not you're not building a world you're like picking a uh, uh, one one point in the in the cosmographic space that you want to go to um and or like a sketching on a region of that so that like the discovery versus building part but then also getting them to realize that that um you know, that, that world building that like actually what is the, what is a world made of it is is a, a sets of interconnected objects for lack of a uh, things right so i um actually i as what started out as a classroom activity i ended up throwing up on itch as like a little mini game that i call no worlds but in things whereas just like no like guys just literally describe a plant to me that exists in your world what does it look like how does it you know how does it propagate 
uh, you know, what, what relationships might it have with other things? And just kind of having that be a question, a question game back and forth of like, how big is this? What does it, does it have leaves? What color are its leaves? And collaboratively answering those questions back and forth as like kind of a grounding tool in world building. Like they're like, I want to make a cyberpunk reality. And it's like, no, well, tell me about one. So like uh, the students came up with, uh, and they started the people doing kind of a cyberpunk ish world. They came up with a, uh, uh, people were illegally growing like roof corn in this cyberpunk reality, and they like they went into the kind of the genetic modifications and things that were happening of these kind of like uh, urban urban gardening or urban farming stuff that was happening in their world that was uh, kind of illicit because of the like it was going against uh, intellectual property laws and things like that in their cyberpunk future. And so by starting with like thinking about okay, well how to like where is the where is the wheat where where do, where are the plants what, what what's going on with that and coming up with those concrete details that led them into like narrative directions that they would not have otherwise been able to go so that's been a cool thing to kind of learn with them as i'm kind of like i don't know let's try these things and see what happens as we it make must, it must be super interesting to do that with students who are really geared toward video games as well where the distinction between a door that's a texture and a door that's functional is a serious world building consideration right there's some sleight of hand that needs to happen yeah well and, that, and that's the other thing is that uh, thinking getting them to think of world building as an activity that they do that sort of precedes world presentation right so the, like and the, like learning that the, the the contours of that iceberg uh like that they that the, the the all of the world building that they've done being the, the bottom of it and then what actually gets presented and being very strategic about what's what's above water so to speak um because of because of those the because of how hard coded in many ways those those video game aspects have to be, um, but uh, that and it it leads me towards something that I I haven't been able to put my finger on exactly at or, or trace it, but I've been thinking about this sense that we often get when we encounter a, a world through any any piece of medium, whether it's a role playing game or it's presented to us in a more traditional media. There's a certain just a, a, a quality that you that I feel like can be detectable like there is serious world building at the back end of this that I'm not seeing but I feel its effect on on the part of the world that I am seeing and I I I, I haven't come up with language to describe what it is that I'm what I'm sensing when I see that yeah I know I know exactly what you mean okay I have a, another question here um, if that's if you're ready for it uh, I'm going to read this one verbatim. A lot of game mechanics work to refine a possibility to the concrete. What other mechanics explicitly expand the possibility space, whether or not you then refine it later? I'm immediately, like, I, I, if I'm understanding where, 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 there's, where, where they're going with it, um, the thing that jumps to mind is like, uh, like oracle mechanics, where you know, uh, like uh, alone, in, alone in the ancient city, Takuma Kata's game, where you're, you're, fl or any of those kind of card prompt games, where you flip over, whether it's tarot or a, a standard deck of cards, where it's like this is the five of hearts, and th that is kind of a refining down, but it's a, it, it also is like an opening up because it's not answering a question for me, it's it's framing the question in a way that I can answer it. Um, so it, le it it's a it kind of uh, leads me through a narrow gate that then opens back up out. On how that how that little that one input constraint sh hits my or if I were at a table of people our like collective imagination. Yeah, I think about player facing mechanics, a game like Archipelago, where the answer to the question might be uh, you can get what you want, but it's going to hurt someone else, and then you ask someone to tell you what that means. So it's essentially oracular. Yeah, a question as a as a mechanic, like questions as a type of mechanic, I think is an interesting idea. Like they yeah, like well, it's going to hurt someone. Who's it going to hurt? Um, that's both a, like a constraint, and then that opens back up out. So you're redirecting the the ship of the game towards a a, a set of possibilities. But and asking asking oh. another player to surprise you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then and then also also I think complicating that idea, Nick, that you just said that you were. The students would come into your class because they wanted to tell a story, not so much, at least at first, not so much because they really understood world building um, as its own sort of dynamic. But I think I think that that sort of takes people out of that linear narrative if you're using mechanics like like asking a question and not knowing the answer. 
that's that's really interesting. That's I think great... that's interesting. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I was just saying that's a great question. Oh, yeah, no, it is, and I think it it gets me circling back around to thinking about using this in. Uh, for lack of a better word, serious ways, or like the, uh, if we, maybe we could say like pure science and applied science, right? Like uh, like just making games that are, take us to interesting worlds that are fun is pure science. And then applied science is like what, what Jason did uh, with UNICEF. So it's like, all right, I, I know some stuff about how to get people to imagine futures. Uh, how can I apply that? Um, I, I wonder like how, in, in maybe in that project, uh, Jason, did you, like seeing the diff that, that distinction between the story, storytelling and world building as they're thinking about those futures. That's a that's a really great question, and and uh, the 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 full arc of this project was uh, students would engage with this game, and they would create one of these imagined futures, uh, which would then uh, be given to uh, or is in the process of being given to science fiction authors who are taking the parameters that these students have defined and creating fiction in that world. So it really does go from world building to storytelling over the lifespan of the imagined health futures project oh that's fantastic yeah it's really cool it's it's just such a good idea so that's, I was, that's, that's all through unison yeah uh yeah yep so that'll and be it, up on a website yeah and, I, and I, I can i can share the game materials uh the facilitator's guide uh, to the game piece of it and the rest of it it's uh it was a grant from the lancet i think that allowed them to do it and uh, it's in progress, and I'm not exactly sure where. In the, but they have ten authors who are going to be writing fiction based on these uh, students' uh, worlds. So I, I think the fantastic thing about that to me is that is that it's continuing that full circle loop of of, of world building and then world presentation, or yeah. like the, the that the story the story that the author creates is going to be a vehicle that or a tool that will help a, a bunch of other people imagine that same world that those people right. in that project imagined, and then. The, the kind of the the, con, the the continuation step is that then they will inevitably be reverse engineering from that possible future back to their present moment and being like okay well what do i do when i wake when i get out of bed tomorrow that will like steer the reality around me towards or away from that story depending on on depending on the story itself totally yeah So I did just get a comment uh, from Sciartica, uh, I think referring back, Jason, to your um, UNICEF the, the facilitator materials that you used in the UNICEF project. Uh, if you're willing to share those or yeah, give totally. out a link to them, then we can do that in the uh, Discord after the panel or whatever. Or yeah, just I, have, people. <laughs> I have the links here and I, I can share them, I just don't know how. Okay. I mean, do I like do I put them in the Discord or should I go to the Twitch stream or I don't know what? Well, if you're not in the Twitch stream, don't bother. Uh, we can put it in the Discord in the Zones of Connections Discord uh, after the event. Just you know. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. That's it. So I don't have any other questions at the moment. So if you want to continue to converse, go right ahead. So I, I guess I have a I have a unless Sam, you have if unless you have got one lined up. I have a, I have a, I have a couple, but but Nick, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. So I, one of the things I've been thinking about, and and I'd like to to hear your takes on, and then see if it if anyone in the chat has uh, thoughts too, maybe even is that. So uh, I've been thinking about. So if we if this framing that I've been thinking of in terms of like we've got all of these possible futures, some of them are useful to us, some of them are maybe not useful or not useful in the way that we want for a particular task, and so if I compare that to like a. a like a geologist who wants to know, who has certain questions that they need to solve in, in, in their pursuit of, of geological knowledge, they, they're going to know, I'm, I need to find a particular rock formation. So I'm, I need to look for this particular area of the planet. And so I think that one of our, one of the, the, the job, the tasks that we have to learn to address and like that we can, uh, that, that I want to get better at at least is, is how to identify those, those possibly, how do, how do we start thinking about identifying possibly, possible possibly useful areas of of possibility space like identifying potentially useful imagined worlds and like how do we how do we come up with that and then and then create games that direct people towards those 
those areas of imagination that we think might be useful. Is that I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, isn't that isn't that what you're what you're up to in um, the class? Or I mean, what? Let me let me toss it back to you. What do you think are the obstacles to that? Well, it's just the uh, I think that. Well, yeah, when you phrase it back to me the, in, in, in that way, I, I think I'm thinking about um, the, the 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 starting points, I guess, and, and maybe answering my my own question as you're framing because I'm thinking I, I'm used to like having to on the slide like come up with how how am I going to address this to, to a group of students and, and pretend that I know what I'm saying. Uh, I I think there's something about like the role of of concrete observation of the world that you do live in. Uh, that then that then you have to be better at framing the problem space that you're trying to address, I think maybe is is the issue. So how how observations of of how bizarre the world, like uh, you're we're talking about being surprised, right? So uh, I think that there's a cultivation of a certain kind of experience that uh, or a certain uh, stance towards towards the the impoverished future where it, it can potentially always be surprising, whatever whatever world you end up in, because there's like infinite odds against it. I don't know how to calculate you know, th those odds exactly. So cultivating that sense of wonder towards the world that you're in, but then connecting, like actually getting kind of connected with things that are in arm's reach of you that then, um, that are, are that, that, that will then direct you towards uh, worlds that are, that, that are that derive from you the world that you're in rather than uh i don't know capitalistic concerns like the the worlds that 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 that, that are dominating movies and tvs right now those worlds aren't dominating movies and tvs because they're partic particularly useful for humans to think with like in a, in a kind of way that the uh, like levi strauss's myths are good to think with um they're dominating the the ecosystem because that's what because that's what's maximized that's profit maximization questions right um so I, don't, I, I think I've just talked myself back into a circle again, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I, mean, I, think, I, I think that's where we started with this, with this discussion was, was maybe, you know, thinking about, I mean, on, on, on many levels, I mean, game mechanics, game worlds, you know, can be just as impoverished as the world in which, um, we're told that we live in again going back to this idea that that there are other possibilities there are other alternatives um but you know we we are encouraged through processes of ideology uh to sort of think of the world as operating in this way and futures will be built according to these tools so i think that's the that's the big challenge and i think jason was with this and so were you with your class about how one might um try to use different prompts, different mechanics uh, in order to gesture to something else. And I, I mean, my thought is that is that I don't think that it, it needs to be something that, and I, Nick, you, you made, a, made a point about this like, sort of idea of, uh, of a fully realized game world that you don't understand fully, that you've, you, know, you've, you, you only have your part that you're actually in in the moment, but you sense this complexity around you. I think I mean, that's that's a really interesting idea that this alternative world, um, alternative possibility doesn't need to be fully realized. Like like here it is, this is it. It's something that, that can simply be evoked in the course of a game without necessarily spelling it out. And in fact, maybe spelling out that alternative in a sense, um, like a, almost like a quantum sort of, it sort of collapses it back into regular time um so having that that kind of the the mystique of of this complexity of a world that's out there but cannot be realized and this is this is by the way this is this is the way frederick jameson talks about utopia you know for him i mean he's he's um one of his projects is to sort of reinstate utopian thought something that many people uh um you know reject or or that's just utopian is sort of a, a put down but for him utopia represents the limits of our thinking so when we try to talk about utopia what we're really doing is expressing the limitations of what we can think and feel at this sort of ideological moment 
And so moving beyond it may not be something where we can denotate exactly or represent exactly what that would look like uh, because it's beyond what we can say. Yeah, that's fascinating to me. Like, it's a whole different utility. Uh, like, I, it's it's pointing utilities of, of utopian of, of utopian worlds that I haven't considered at all. The, the, so you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, you're saying that it's like uh, just asking a just asking a culture or a person what's the what's the best thing that you can imagine right now? Like, not 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 that you can imagine us realistically getting to anything like that, but what's the best possible world that you can imagine? And, and just as as a kind of pulse taking or a uh, is, you know, to, and you can to be able to look back over historically different utopias that, that people have imagined and, and kind of figure out where where we're at kind of taking the taking the uh, diagnostics on our on our imaginative range uh because that's the other thing is that, is that games i think enhance our imaginative range and i think that um even though like it's it's hard for people to think in utopian terms because of the optimism pessimism uh, kind of balance that, that most of us people are are in at the future that actually we have tools, or we've we've refined lots of interesting tools in the past fifty years uh, that actually do extend our imaginative range and and kind of precision. That as we, as I and I think that there is a move towards increasingly thinking about utopian uh, worlds. Actually, uh, there's a Joe Walton has a, a, a collective a collected volume that he's putting he's put together. The CFP uh, went out this spring called. Utopia on the tabletop. That's specifically kind of thinking yeah, utopian okay. thinking and games. That um, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and so I think that as as people start to step into that, we'll find that uh, fifty years of of the past fifty years of game design have have made us have enhanced our capabilities for answering that question. What's the greatest world that you can think of? It's, it's hey, oh, I'm sorry. I I do have one other question, and I also want to let you know that there's like uh, eleven minutes left. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation, that's cool. If you'd like me to ask the question, I will ask it now, or I can wait until you're done with this. Finish your ask it. Okay. Um, this is a pretty good question. Do we need games that reveal worlds that are actually existing, but that we're taught to ignore or not see? And should uh, and, and and should we make games that pull out those and focus those worlds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, th that's something that uh, that a lot of my work focuses on is uh, looking at things that um, are un under under uh, underutilized, lesser understood, but important facets of history. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in that, for sure. What yeah, do you think, Nick. You know, I, I'm I'm 100 with you. I I. I... It made me think I had a, a professor in, in undergraduate who was said something that stuck with me because it was the first time I'd really thought about like purposes of art. And he said one of the functions of art is uh, if someone's painting a tree that they're, that they're saying like, no, just actually look at that tree. Uh, not like not what the your idea of what you think a tree is, but to actually like look at it with with your own eyes and kind of remove the veil of, of like uh, assumptions that you've been making about that tree. And then like in visual art, that that's a, a, a possibility. And I think that that's what uh games can do in this case and at least what i'm getting from that question of uh no actually look at the world in which you live they're like to, uh, because it, it it's um it's either disenchanted if you ask weber or that there's like uh like kind of if you think of things like ideas like false consciousness or like there's a way that you think that the world is there's a, an illusion that's been cast on you by your cultural upbringing by your socialization that makes it hard for you to see um on un, un, unpleasant realities maybe or uh or even pleasant realities like that you're not interacting with the world as it actually is and that a game can just be something that like holds your face to an aspect of, of the actual world and so like no this is this is the world in which you live it's also uh i, I think we have such a privilege as uh game designers and thinkers that the, the uh, game mechanics can be social engineering so if you want people to think about positive futures only give them inputs and outputs that allow that uh and uh I, I do that all the time, and I think it's uh, it, it can be it can be valuable to guide people in specific directions. Samuel, are, are you? Did you? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm here. I'm uh, um, just sort of losing on, on my on my video, so I just I just I just cut it out. But uh, yeah, I mean, 
I think I think the 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 question was basically I mean that's the that's kind of what we were uh, going for uh, with that discussion. So in a way that was that was a great summation of uh, or perhaps that was a better summation of what we were trying to say at the beginning. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. It it makes me think of the one of the first games I played with my students when we went when we switched online after the pandemic. I was telling Jason this right before we started is we played a game of microscope and and for those that haven't played microscope you, you one of the first things you do in the game is it's a collaborative time timeline building game we'll say uh where you, you set a beginning period and an end period and uh i said well we'll play a game of microscope where the beginning period is uh the beginnings of the covid 19 pandemic and the the ending period is something better than this and so like kind of what you're saying jason of like i like setting those boundaries of we're gonna we're gonna imagine something better right now, and that you're gonna have to do that. Uh, and I, I think we even sent some additional constraints, like uh, you, uh, no aliens showing up to to solve all our problems for us, like no no like no Deus ex machina allowed in your timelines. And and now go like how can you realistically imagine, given things that you consider somewhat likely, something better? And that that involves paying attention very closely to actual uh, reasons for hope that are existing around you. Yep. Without without articulating that, like it, that's a that's a really subtle way to get people thinking in a positive and uh, hopeful way. I think that's the that's the operative word. You both used it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm like very interested in. I mean, this is this is sort of an anthropological topic, but I mean, hope is everyday utopia. And if we want to think about alternatives, well, everybody on the planet hopes for something. And I think um, um, that can lead us in, in all kinds of directions. So, yeah, uh, games that inspire hope or, or um, you know, prompts within games. What do, they, what do they come up with, Nick? Uh, you know, I'd have to go back and look. But like, I'm, it's, it's been, it's been uh, in pandemic years, it's been a century. It was like right <laughs> when we started. Uh, so that is a good question. As we go into international world building again, I, I think I'm going to go back and look at that. Um, but when you say that hoping is operative word, it, it um, resonated with me. There's a, a speech that Ursula K. Le Guin gave when she got the National Book Foundation medal. And I think it was in 2015. Um, and there's just one paragraph. I, I, I pulled it up real quick here because I, I, I make all my students watch it when we're talking about these things. And in 2015, she said, hard times are coming when we'll be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being, and even imagine real grounds for hope. We'll need writers who can remember freedom, poets, visionaries, realists of a larger reality. Um, and yeah, that, that hope line being central, I think you're exactly right, that that's, that's the key. We got to find it. Yeah, that, that's a nice piece. I was just, last week I was on a, um, on a marathon reading of The Dispossessed. Mm. And of course, one of her one of her big sort of uh, um, interesting sort of alternatives, a failed utopia in some ways, uh, but just just a, just a great novel to think with. Now, when is, what is the subtitle of that? Is it a failed utopia or a? a, a there's, no, there's no, that a, was that was like that was like my subtitle. <laughs> oh, because the, the, there is a subtitle to the dispossessed that's like a, yeah. a, a complicated utopia, or I can't remember Something exactly. Like right. Yeah. Right. I think that's a, that's a fantastic example of a very useful sketch out of a future that's like utopian but complicated. You know, one of the oh. one of the things also about about well, lots of games uh, is that 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 time the introduction of difference. In fact, that was one of the questions that I that I wanted to ask you all. In a way, I mean, in order to imagine alternatives, uh, you can start from right here, right now. But in some ways, trying to sort of dislocate people from the here and now, um, do you find that to be a, a positive um, for imagining alternatives, or is that something that that you, you really haven't done? Uh, I know, Jason, that wasn't the case with what looks like your UNICEF project, but the other stuff seems to have that. Yeah, for sure. Like abstraction can be really uh, a really useful tool if the material you're approaching is going to be too dissonant or too traumatic for people to to deal with in the moment. So like I, I've, I made a game about combat interpreters in Afghanistan, but it's space Afghanistan. Uh, and people are much more likely to engage with the material uh, without having to worry about 
uh, cultural issues related to um, uh, that time and place, which is so contemporary. But but other other times the the opposite. I made the opposite decision. So yeah, I think abstraction can be really useful. Uh, yeah, what, but, and whatever but, the emotional valence of of that well established way of of being towards the question at hand. Uh, it's it's a rut, right? It's like a it's a it's an imaginative rut that like means that people are going to likely if you don't uh, make it space Afghanistan, then they're less likely to kind of to step outside of new because it's it's just a well worn cultural the discourses are, are strong in, in certain areas, right? And so the and those areas going further afield and, and kind of while still keeping the the core questions and problems the same. That's that's a, a strength of of a of a solid game like that. All right, we've got about three minutes left. I'm going to suggest that you use the uh, remaining time to uh, uh, wrap everything up and remind everybody uh, where they can engage with you and your work. Well, Jason, go ahead. Okay, uh, my, uh, my company is Bully Pulpit Games. You can find it at bullypulpitgames.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at, at JMSTAR. Uh, that's probably the place where I'm most public. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you, talk about these things more. Uh, and I'm happy to share what we talked about uh, today with you. Um, I am at Nick Miser on Twitter. It's M-I-Z-E-R. And uh, that's probably the best place to get a hold of me. Um, uh, or I guess... Uh, no, I, I, guess that, I guess that's it. Twitter <laughs> at Nick Miser. That, that, that's me online. <laughs> And I'm I'm on I'm on Twitter a couple different places I guess but um um a lot of the the ideas in fact uh, I'm 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 writing up a, a a blog post for for this stuff uh is on uh, a blog that I keep and sporadically update uh, just called uh, tomorrowculture uh, dot blogspot dot com and uh, I have to be like one of the last people on that on that blog platform but. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually the, this like, book that I that I wrote a few years ago is coming out in a couple of days in its second edition, and I'm not really sure exactly why the publisher is doing that, but uh, but they are. And that book's called All Tomorrow's Culture Cultures, and um, it's um, subtitled Ecological Engagements with the Future, and it does talk about games, albeit uh, in a, in a way that is now. Um, and that's been interesting because there's been a lot of cool stuff that's happened since I wrote that book in 2006. Oh, and I guess I should mention uh, mentioning books. I, my book is called Tabletop Role Playing Games and the and the Experience oh, yeah. of Imagined Worlds. Uh, so that's that another is, spot that to is, interact with some of my thinking on this. That is the coolest book, Nick. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was really I happy. My one of my favorite things was that they let me pick the cover image. I didn't know that was my first book. I didn't know that that was even a possibility. Uh, and I didn't think they would let me pick a forest of mushrooms, but they did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's all it, it, total honest thing feel to it. I, I, I liked it a lot. Thank you. And thanks this for putting been, this together. Samuel. Yeah, this has been great, Samuel. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Well, thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. All right, cool. That's a wrap.